Okay, so we are going to work on integrated rate laws, which are really simple. And half-life is also really simple. You just have to know how to use the equation. So take your equation sheet out. I'm going to grab mine. And I'm going to show you where the laws are and how to use them today. And honestly, it is super simple as long as you stare at that equation and use it correctly. You don't really have to think much about these. So on your equation sheet, the first page of equations, you'll see kinetics. You all have to look at it because they don't label them for you. They just give you a bunch of equations, and then you have to know which one to use. So the first one is a natural log. The second one is a 1 over concentration. Do you see that? Get there so that you look at it. I wrote this on that table the other day that was over there. Remember I showed you if you double the concentration and it stays the same, then that one was zero order. And then the concentration versus time graph would give you a straight line, right? I wrote that in that little table. And then I said if it's a first order rate law, then concentration doubles, the rate doubles, and the graph of ln a versus time would give you a straight line. So now you're going to look at these um, equations, and you have to recognize which one's first order and which one's a second order reaction integrated rate law. So really simple. This is how it works. Which one is the first one written? First order. The first order. Natural log is your first order integrated rate law. And then the second one written is for the second order rate law. So what you have to recognize is just which one gives you the straight line. And then look at the axes and say, OK, so maybe you don't remember 1 over concentration means second order. But you match 1 over concentration to the second order equation right here. And you'll be like, oh, well, that's a second order graph. Or if it's a first order graph, you'll say, well, that one's a straight line. So then that must be the first order equation. So based on my example right here, which one is this? What's the, what is that? First, second, zero order. Yeah, of course. But, but is it? What is the order? Zero, zero. zero order because the first graph gave the straight line and the units were concentration versus time. So I'm going to use that graph and then I'll use zero order for my rate law. Uh, so we're going to use these laws and then we'll calculate half-life today. Uh-oh. Hold on. I have to close it and reopen it. All right, so this is the equation. It says if you integrate it with calculus, this is what you end up getting. Don't really worry about how it comes about, but just recognize that this is the natural law of concentration at some time. So as the reactions progress, this is some concentration. This time has to match this time. So if you pick, say, 60 seconds, then this concentration needs to match what it is at 60 seconds. And then this will always be time zero. So whatever the initial concentration is, that's what you're going to plug in here. K, again, is your rate constant that you're going to solve for. So if you rearrange this, you get a Y equals MX plus B. I don't think that they often ask you. It's very, very infrequent. I mean, if I look back at 30 years of AP exams, I maybe saw like once or twice where they ask you to find K from the slope of a line. They could ask you to do that. So just recognize that your slope of your line is your K value. So you could calculate it by doing change in Y over change in X. So if you take those, you plot this, you get a straight line for a first order reaction, which is what I've been telling you all along, right? So you look at your axes, you get a straight line, your slope is negative k because you can't have a negative k value. Your slope's negative, so that's why you put the negative in front of it. Yep? I thought the straight line was for a zero order. The straight line represents any order, zero, first, or second. What you do as a chemist is you take your data, Whatever it might be, your concentration data, which you're likely going to get from a spectrophotometer using Beer's Law. Remember we discussed that already? So you take your concentration data that you calculated, and you make three plots. You take an Excel graph, and you make these three plots. So your axes change for y every time. And then you take your three plots, and you look at which one gives you the straight line. And the one that gives you a straight line is the order of your reaction. Ooh, good question, Kristen. That helped everybody. So, like, say, for example, I took this now, and this one looked like this, and this one was straight. Then it would be a first order. And you're going to see that on your homework tonight. In fact, everybody just quickly, quickly flip to your homework. Look at question five. 
right now, you can see which one is that. So what is this order of the reaction for question five? How did JC come up with second order? Which one's straight? The first, second, or third graph? The third, the third graph. What does the axis for y say? One over, one over concentration. You go back and look at your equation sheet, and you see that one over concentration means second order. Do you follow that? Look at number six. What's that order? First order, because the first graph is a straight line, its axes are L and A, and you know that L and A from your equation sheet gives you a first order reaction. So the, if it's a zero order, then it's just concentration versus time. Good question. All right, so if we wanted to find K, we could do it directly from the slope of the line. All right, so let's just try this. Here's a reaction. Here's the data. We plot the data. And then we're going to find the rate law, the rate constant, and the concentration at some time. So here's what I will say to some students. They don't know what to do with the information they're given. You're going to have three different ways to solve for rate laws by the time we're done with all kinetic lectures. So you have to recognize that that first lecture, I gave you data where I, we had two reactants for sure, and one of them stayed constant and the other one changed, and I gave you rate. I don't give you rate here. I just give you time and concentration, which means you could find rate, essentially, but you wouldn't have the ability to do, like, if the concentration of this doubled while this stayed the same, what would happen? You wouldn't have the ability to do that. Um, so if you tried to manipulate this table into what we did in lecture one, it wouldn't work for you. So you'd have to recognize that you would come up with something else. Anytime they give you the graphs, there's a good chance you're doing the integrated rate laws anyway. So uh, you know it's in a first order because this is a straight line, and then we're going to use this data directly and plug it into the integrated rate law, and that's as simple as it is. It's just really making sure that you recognize to use that equation is probably the hardest part. So the rate law only has one reactant. Remember, our rate law is always equal to K times the concentration of a reactant's raised to some power, right? Well, you only have one reactant here, so that means that it's first order to that reactant. But what if I had two reactants? What would it mean, have to mean of the second one? That it had to be zero order. Because if this is a first order reaction and I have two reactants, it means that one of them is first order and the other one zero order, right? Say I had a second order reaction with two reactants. It could mean that one of them is second order and the other one zero, or it could mean that they're both first order. Do you understand that? I'm just throwing that in there as a side point. So we're going to just take this one and we're going to write the rate law. So you know it's first order, so you write rate equals what? Yeah, throw it down on your paper. And you got that directly from just staring at a graph. You didn't have to calculate anything like we did in lecture one. So say there was a reactant here that was A plus B, and we knew that this was first order. You would recognize that it was first order with respect to A because your concentration graph is of A. Does that make sense? I have never seen them do that either. All right, so now we're going to find K, and in order to do that, we have to look at our equation sheet. So you're going to get the first order integrated rate law, which is given to us as ln concentration of A at some time minus the natural log of concentration at time zero is equal to negative kT. So if we're solving for K, we want to rearrange this so we're going to divide by T and throw the negative sign on the outside. Everybody follow that? So rearrange your equation before you start. So we're going to look at the data that's given to us back in this table. I'm just going to put it back up. And you're going to pick, obviously, time zero here as 0 0.020. But you can pick any time. If you wanted to choose something further down, you could, or just choose the very next one. So if this is 50 seconds, recognize that they're putting it in scientific notation so that you use the correct number of sig figs for that problem. So we're just going to take the natural log of 50 seconds time. So that's ln of the concentration 0.017 minus the natural log of the concentration at time 0, 0, 0.020, all over time, which is going to be 50 seconds. So 5.0 times 10 to the first. Put your negative sign on the outside, and then that will be equal to k. What should your units be? 
1 over s, right? Because it's a first order reaction. All right, so make sure that you try this in your calculator because the natural log function, you may need parentheses, you may not. On your own calculator, be careful. It's really important that you're using your own calculator here. So the answer is up, just check when you're done. Okay, so 3.3 times 10 to the negative third, 1 over seconds gives you your k. So I'm going to write that down here, just so when we go to the next slide, we can follow that. So once you know this, you can utilize it to calculate the concentration at a different time. So this would be helpful for engineers. Uh, if you're doing a reaction, you know your rate law, you know your K value, and you want to know, like, uh, at 2 o'clock in the morning, what's the concentration going to be of this? So you could go and just throw it into this equation and then calculate exactly what your concentration should be, as long as everything goes well. So now we're going to find concentration at 500 seconds. And then again, you use T equals 0, what you initially started with. So you're going to put it back into this equation. And you are going to be now solving for ln a t. So look, I'm just going to rearrange this for you. And instead, you're finding t at this point. So you're going to divide. I'm sorry, you're not finding t. That was a joke. You're finding ln a, right? So I would just treat this whole expression as an x for the moment. So that way, you're just solving for x, essentially. And then you guys need to recognize what do you do. So we have negative kt plus ln a is equal to ln a at some time. So what do you do if you have a natural log? How do you get rid of it? You e it. Remember we did this before? So now I'm going to have to e all of this information and get it there. So that's probably the trickiest part. And I would say that make sure that you recognize how to set this up so that you don't make a mistake um, when solving this. So here's where we are right here. We have our k and our t and our ln of our initial concentration. And then you just e all of it, right? To get rid of this, you e this all to solve for it. So negative kt plus ln a at time 0. So that part um, might be tricky. So try in your calculator to get all of this in there. And then 500 seconds is going to be your time. So you're solving for what the new concentration will be at that time. OK, so you should get 3.8 times 10 to the negative third. And the concentration is molarity. So make sure that you use that as your answer. So I just want to go back. You'll see this today. I'll show you something with your homework. But I want to point something out to you. Say, for example, that this graph gave you data. So it was actually marking all of these points. And this was like, I don't know, whatever it could be, a negative 3.8 or something like that. I think they're negative values. So if this value here was given to you, and you wanted to go, and they didn't give you this data, and you went to go plug it in, recognize that you would not take the natural log of this value, because it's already giving it to you as the natural log. There's a few AP questions that do that, and students sometimes handle that wrong. So say this number here was, um, I don't have a marker. I'm just going to make a number up, 5. And this number is 1, OK? If I was going to take my concentration at some time, so this is 60 seconds and this is 0 seconds, then I would plug this in as 1 directly here minus initial concentration 5. Do you see that? I'm not going to put natural log of 1 minus natural log of 5 because it's already giving it to me as the natural log. So don't do it twice. You'll get the wrong answers. You'll see that in your homework. OK. Uh, this question says, it's just kind of a theory question. So data from an experiment which examined the change in concentration over time for a first order process at 25 degrees Celsius was used to plot the graph below. Sketch a line that shows the approximate results that would be expected if the same experiment was repeated at a lower temperature. So think about this. If something is a reaction is going and you decrease the temperature, what's going to happen in general? I know this is a little bit thermodynamics, but will it slow down or speed up? Yeah. It's going to slow down. So this is your rate constant. Remember the slope of this line? m is equal to negative k. Your rate constant tells you how fast something's going to go, won't it? So if you all just said it slows down, then the slope of your line should look a certain way. So sketch what the slope should look like.
like this. Did you sketch a shallower slope? At the same exact time, all of you just went. Your eyes just popped open to look up here. Slopes are shallow if they're like this. They're steep if they're like this, right? A shallow slope means that it's not as fast. A steep slope means it's, as, it's faster, right? So if the temperatures decrease, you should have a shallower slope. So the, the dotted line should be above it, and they should start in the same spot. Agreed? Okay. Moving along. Half-life. Yeah. Sure. Half-life. Um, I like half-life. I like to solve, especially they give multiple choice questions for these. Um, and they're kind of easy to handle. They're thoughtful because you just figure out how many like uh, iterations that you go through. So here's what half-life is. You essentially are calculating how long it takes to have a certain amount of something and chop it in half directly. And then that same amount of time will take how long it takes to cut it in half again, right? The concentration. So if I'm taking like myself and it takes me five years to chop myself in half, okay, so now I have half of myself. In five years more, I should have how much of myself? I should have a quarter of myself because now I'm halving that again. And then in five more years, I have much, how much of myself? And so essentially, I can keep doing this, and do I ever get rid of myself? Never, right? You just continue <laughs> cutting everything in half, right? So here are the questions that you end up getting asked for multiple choice. You either get asked, like, what is the final concentration at some time, knowing what your half-life is, right? Or you might be able to calculate what the half-life is specifically, the time it takes, given some information about, like, how many times you go through concentration. So... What's important about this is that this half-life graph and half-life equation is used only for first-order reactions. So you're not going to do this for a second order. If they give you this graph, and sometimes they do, they might ask you what this graph is of, and it's a half-life graph. Um, so it's just you can recognize it because your concentration is cutting in half each time. Um, you also can recognize because it's the concentration versus time isn't giving you a straight line, so that wouldn't be zero order either. Right? Um, and then we'll use this data. Sometimes they give it to you so you can calculate time and concentration. So here is a graph. It says find the half life for the following reaction. So what do you know to start? This is what? How do we know it's first order? It's a straight line of a natural log versus time, and that means it's first order. So it's asking you to find half-life. Half-life means what part of the equation? T. Half-life is time. Always time, right? So you're essentially going to use the first order integrated rate law to find T time, right? So let me walk you through this, and then we're not going to do it because you don't need to do it. I could, right, come up with concentration. I can find the concentration value of this or plug this into the first order integrated rate law right there. So I could take, say, this time here, and then do this time, and then how do I find my k? k is always equal to the slope, m, slope of the line. So I could do change in y over change in x to find the slope, and then I would be able to utilize this equation right here and solve for t, the half-life. But just wait, and I'm going to walk you through it, because we don't need to use it. Because do you see that there's an equation right here? They used to not give that. So all the teachers would just tell the students, memorize 0.693 divided by k is your half-life. And then they decided to put it on. So you're not going to really use it, but I want you to understand where it comes from. You always get the same constant. So this is the slope of my line, which we all just recognize you can find by doing change in y over change in x, right? And then that's equal to k. But for any half-life problem, I just explained that whatever you start with, you're going to end up with exactly half of it, right? So that's going to be the same ratio no matter what you plug in here. So what they do is you can just arbitrarily plug in. This is the concentration 1 to start with, time 0, concentration is 1. And then at like some time later on, because it will be exactly half that for a half-life, right, would be 0.5. Or if I started with 2, this would end up being 1. Or if I started with 3, this would be 1.5. 
So if you're doing a half-life equation, you would take your initial concentration and half it yourself, right? Any time that you take the natural log of a half from the natural log of the whole, you exactly end up with 0.693. So that's why you don't even have to worry about what those values are, because it's always going to be a constant for the half-life of that. So we will use 0.693 divided by k, and you'll come up with the exact time that it would take to get rid of something. So this, if you want, you can even try it right now in your calculator. I guarantee it, it's going to be 0.693. So you'll just use that equation, and then you divide it by k, and then that will give you your half-life. That's given to you. I think it was two years ago on the AP exam, there was a half-life question. And one of my students came to me and said, I have no idea how to answer this one question, but it said half-life, and I threw it in and used the half-life equation. She's like, I think I got it right. And when I looked at the questions after they posted them a few days later, it was exactly what you had to do. So when you're not sure how to handle something, likely the answers are going to be somewhere on these equation sheets. Okay, uh, just think about this also. If your rate constant is large, that means that it's going fast, right? So rate constant tells you how fast it's going. So if I have a really fast rate constant, say, what does that mean about the half-life? It's really short. So say it takes me, instead of five years to chop myself in half, my rate constant's higher, I'm going to chop myself in half in like five days. Get it? So my half-life would be shorter because my rate constant is faster. And then the opposite of that is true, obviously. So take this question. Assuming you don't have a calculator, so you're not going to be able to actually calculate half-life, look at your rate constants. Recognize that your rate law are for first-order integrated rate law. This is which of the following processes has the shorter half-life? Justify your answer. The what? Process one. So this is like, think of it this way. This happens or cycles 428 times per minute. This cycles or happens 296 times per minute. Right? Minutes is in the denominator. So if this is happening faster, then to get to half the concentration, it'll be quicker. So this will have a shorter half-life. Does that make sense? The other one would have a longer half-life. So it says both processes are first order. Process one occurs at a faster rate when both systems share the same initial concentrations as its rate constant has a larger magnitude. Yeah? For justification, could you just put 0.693 divided by both of them? Like justification? Right, this is likely, you could. I think you could, and then you could actually calculate the half-life to show it. I can't imagine that they wouldn't accept that as a justification. Uh, I could see this being more of a, a multiple choice question, and then you wouldn't justify it. Sorry. Yep? Um, with justifications for genetics, are we still going to have to if you have to write a paragraph ever about two things, you should always discuss both of them. Just as a general good paragraph writing. All right, almost done with this lecture. Second order integrated rate law, really simple. You recognize it's second order, you use the equation, and you solve. It's as simple as that. So again, time, the T stands for some time that's progressed after. Same thing, your slope of your line is k. It's not negative this time because it's a straight line that looks like this. So recognize your uh, y-axis is 1 over concentration versus time. You get a straight line, so you know that this is second order, and that k is equal to the slope of the line. We've done that before. And so here's your question. You get two graphs this time. You determine the rate law. You calculate the rate constant. So go ahead and write the rate law. So you look at your equation sheet. In case you're not sure, the first equation is first order. The second equation is second order. So you should have came up with rate equals k times NO2 squared. There's only one reactant. I heard you saying that. And then you know it's second order because you have the straight line of that one graph. To mess with you. Yeah, you'll get three, actually. So you're just not supposed to use the one? Nope. Remember, it's just here's the data that somebody collected. Now you decide what to do oh, with it. Graph. Yep. All right, so now we're going to find k, and we're going to use the data from time zero and some other time, and just recognize that it's the same setup as before. It's just a different equation. So you go back to your data, 
And now this time, instead of using first order integrated rate law, we're going to use the second order integrated rate law, which is 1 over concentration of A at some time minus 1 over concentration of A at time 0 is equal to KT. And then we will solve for K. So we are going to take that data and all divide that by T to find K. And then just pick a spot for T. So I'm going to pick this one if you're going to follow with me. So it would be 100 seconds. So 1 over 0 0.015 minus 1 over 0 0.070 all over your 100 seconds to three sig figs. So your K value is 0.52. And then since it's second order, this is going to be MS in the denominator. Any of them, and it will work out roughly the same. Like you might get 0.51 or 0.53, but you should get the same rate constant because it's for the entire reaction. Good? I have it up here too because I'm going to go to the next slide. All right, data from this experiment was collected uh, for a second order process. Sketch a line that shows the approximate results that would be expected if the same experiment was repeated at a higher temperature. So higher temperature, we're going to assume, means what? Faster. faster. If it's faster, then my slope should be steeper. steeper. Make a steeper slope. And they need to start at the same time, right? Same spot, same concentration. Time is zero. So it should be something steeper like that. Good? OK, so that's it. So now we're going to try. I don't know that they would take any points off at all, because just higher means higher. Maybe you're assuming really high. I'm assuming a little higher, as long as it's steeper. So we're going to do the AP question.